Um, I was given exactly 10 minutes to do this talk, so I will have to be quick about it. Uh, as you can see, read the title, I'm going to talk about uh, how to approach content creation for VR. There's some certain restraints and techniques you should adhere to when developing VR apps as opposed to regular games. Um, so, let's get right started. First, a little bit about me. I work at the Technical University of Graz. I'm a researcher there for two years now. Uh, and I do research in the area of AR and VR. And I'm also a game developer as a hobby. So on the side, I dabble a little bit in it myself. Um, the topics we are going to cover today is how to create the environment for VR, uh, how to create 3D models, and a brief dip into sound, the red little stepchild of everything. Uh, so let's get right started with environment. Uh, so the environment can be roughly separated into three main layers. So the closest one is the personal space. That is everything I can reach with my arms. Uh, so that's like one and a half meters, two meters maybe, if I have really long arms. Uh, the next one is the immediate space. That is everything that the player can reach within the game. So it's the tracked space, so let's say for the wife, it's four by four meters or five by five meters. Uh, that's the immediate space, and everything past that is treated as background. Uh, and there's certain things you have to consider for these. So for example, in the everything immediate area has to be very detailed, has to have interactions, has to have, has to have physics, whereas in the background is not really that important, you can actually cheat quite a lot there. Um, you should keep in mind that the comfortable view distance is 0.75 meters up to 3.5 meters because uh, your eyes focus in two different ways. There is the uh, accommodation, that is the shape of your lens, and there is the vergence, that is uh, the sh eyes actually look at together if something gets closer, you go like cross-eyed. And the vergence distance, uh, no sorry, accommodation distance is fixed in the VR headset. It's set at like two and a half meters. So the lens always has the same shape, but the cross-eyedness changes depending on where you look in the scene. And if that comes, if the difference between those two is too big, uh, you might get the users might be a little queasy, and so you should keep the most important stuff in the distance mentioned there, where the user spends most of the time looking at. Um, and you should also keep a stable reference frame that is really important when dealing with motion sickness so that the users have something as a reference frame for the actual real world. So the real world doesn't move. So in the VR world, there should be some bit that doesn't move either. You can still move to play around, but give them something to like ground them in the real world. So either most of the time it's just a background, but so the, the background of your game shouldn't twist and move a lot. It should be stable. Or instead, you can use a grounding device. For example, many games, racing games or space games, as you see here in the example, use a cockpit. The cockpit is always moving with you. It doesn't move independently of you, so this grounds you, or you can just use a chair, actually, as well. Um, so how is, uh, in the environment, <coughs> how is depth achieved? So of course, you have the stereoscopic rendering, so there's a difference between two images. Thus, your brain can deduct, deduct how far something is away from you. But actually, that kind of stops working after three to four meters, because then the difference in the image is so small that your brain doesn't really care about that. And so how else can you add depth to your scene? Uh, you, there's a few tricks uh, that you can use to add depth without actually making the scene much, much bigger. So if you want to have a mountain a few kilometers up, you don't actually need to make the game, game scene a few kilometers big, but you can do uh, one of the following things. You can use relative scale. So things that are further away uh, usually tend to get smaller than further they are. So what you can do instead is if something's supposed to be really far away and big, you can actually draw it closer and a little bit smaller, and it still looks like it's super far away, uh, but the size for the rest of the scene still fits. Uh, another thing is texture gradients. So repeating textures get packed with distance. So as you see, the train tracks, the logs get closer and closer together. So you can use that technique that actually textures that are further away get more packed, and so you, again, can cheat with the distance. Um, or you can also abuse the um, curvilinear perspective, so parallel lines meet at some point in perspective projection. And so you can also fake that and not just use parallel lines, but actually make them face together already. So that way you get more depth for your buck, basically. And also rather important for a large scene is the area effects. 
So everything gets a little bit hazy and bluish the further away it is. So you can also just exaggerate that and thus gain more depth. Um, so then let's move right on to the next thing, 3D models. So the problem in VR is um, the user can stick their head close to everything. So they can go like this and have a really close look. So the, for the objects in your immediate or play area, they need to add a lot more details. The textures need to be super fine. So we have on this example, <coughs> Tritex said they have to model every single uh, piece of fiber in the cloth for it to look real because you can look at it like that. Uh, so that eats your performance, of course. Also, you always need to model the entire object. So I remember first time I played Half-Life 2 VR way back in the day, they still used the original gun models, so you could actually turn the gun around and look at nothing because they cut off the rear part because in the normal day you never see. But in VR, you can take any object, turn it around any way you want and can walk around it, so always do the entire thing. Uh, and also, normal maps tend to not work in VR. So actually use uh, either parallax maps <coughs> or just actually model the thing out entirely and use real geometry for that. That usually works best and you don't have to use any cheating techniques. Uh, another thing to consider when creating the 3D objects is <coughs> the resolution of VR headsets is still terrible. Um, and so you want to avoid any noise that might make the user queasy. So for example, avoid all those thin objects. You see all the terrible noise in, in those branches, don't do that. Don't put thin wires, don't put anything thin because the uh, aliasing is, makes actually the users uncomfortable and causes headaches. Uh, in this similar vein, use mid-maps. That is still a mistake you see quite often, is that the mid-maps further away uh, are not used, so you have a, like a high noise texture, uh, which again causes aliasing and causes discomfort. Uh, same for uh, specular maps. So as you see here, there is uh, a lot of noise as you move the map around because you have those fine details that have all those tiny reflections that appear, disappear, blah, blah, blah. Uh, yeah, don't do that either. Again, it's just noise that is not nice to the user. Uh, so I would actually recommend to a pro a use an art style which has simple flat textures without a lot of noise. So as you see this example, it's just one color sometimes, and that works uh, really great. And one problem again is the Uncanny Valley. I think you've probably all heard of it, but it looks real, but not quite. And in VR, that problem is even bigger because everything is more fidelity and whatnot. So uh, you perceive it better. So yeah. <laughs> avoid that. Uh, and last, but not least. Uh, <laughs> Sound, it's really important to use spatial audio. So every sound source should have a position in the room. So many games use like these, uh, I don't know, coin sound when you need to score or something. And that is just somewhere around the player. But in VR, it has to have a certain source where it comes from. And also, of course, use stereo sound. So when the head moves, the sound adapts to it. Um, or else it feels really weird. Um, also, use spoken instructions. Uh, many developers found out if you put up like a sign or a piece of text that explains something, nobody reads that. They like look at it and see all the text and go like and look away again. So instead, tell the users what to do. They don't really care. And yeah, actually the guys at Minecraft also found out if you play music, uh, the users enjoy the experience longer. They don't get sick as easily. I have no idea why. Uh, but. <laughs> Yeah, incorporate that, don't have a completely silent game, but at least have some background jingling going on uh, to make the user more comfortable in, in their experience. Um, actually, I blew through it too quick. I have some bonus stars if you want to see them. Do we have time? Okay, so I'll quickly dip into <laughs> how to make a UI for VR. <laughs> um, one important thing is always take into account where your user is facing when you make your UI if you pop up a menu because I've seen it in many applications before the menu pops up like behind the user and then he presses the button nothing happens and then you actually have to turn around the ah there it is so make it appear in front of the user and also important for the gaze pointer so that is the thing where the user is looking it should always uh, be at the depth of the geometry where you look at because if it's at a fixed distance in front of you the problem is that um, 
the user is focusing on the actual object that you're looking at, which is further away. And so the other object has the wrong focus distance, and then you see it twice, which uh, yeah, sucks. And the UI should be placed in a cylinder around the user. As I mentioned before, the comfortable viewing distance is like two meters. So put it there. Uh, keep it in the center of the actual user's field of view. Don't put it down there as you have in normal video games where it's in the corner. Might look cool, but actually it's pretty bad um, because the user has to look there. You have the worst chromatic aberration. You have the most ar display artifacts down there. Don't put anything there. Uh, also avoid bright stuff in the corners because you actually cause lens flare with that, with the lenses of the VR headset, which of course is uncomfortable. Um, also, it shouldn't be rigidly stuck to your face. You slightly drag it behind, as you maybe see here in the Minecraft example. Uh, that I learned yesterday has to do with uh, <laughs> uh, the reprojection sometimes that happens when you miss a frame and blah. And it's also more comfortable for the user, but you have to strike the balance. It shouldn't be too dragging behind because then you don't see half the time when you look around. Um, and one last thing, uh, you should handle occlusions gracefully. There is no example in the picture, unfortunately. Uh, so since the UI is like two meters in front of you, if you now look it, at that object, my UI is behind it and I don't see it anymore. So one example for that, what you could do is you use two render passes, one that uh, uses the depth information, one that doesn't, and you render it in two different colors. So what you end up with, everything that is occluded by an object actually, gets a slightly different color than the stuff that is not occluded. They do this in Minecraft, unfortunately I actually couldn't find a picture of it. Um, so that grounds the UI in space. And, sorry, now the very last thing. <laughs> uh, you have diegetic interfaces. Diegetic interfaces are interfaces that are part of the world. So as for example here in the spaceship, you actually see the stuff running around the spaceship. It's not some abstract thing floating around in space, or thing floating around in space. But it makes sense in, in, the, in the actual world. So yeah, do that. It's pretty cool, and it uh, helps the inversion. And with that, I'm finally done. <laughs> Okay. I explained everything. Thank you. <laughs>